Kia ora koutou, tālo falava and good evening. Welcome to our fifth emergency budget webinar. The emergency budget responds to the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on Auckland Council's finances. Given the projected $525 million drop in non-rates revenue in the coming financial year. Tonight's webinar is essentially a conversation about a crisis, a crisis that cannot be responded to in a business as usual kind of way. A conversation about the future of Tamaki Makoto and the essential services that Aucklanders need. A conversation about what building for the future looks like and an opportunity for you, our community, to ask questions to help inform your submission and assist the elected members in their deliberations. If you've not already done so, please ensure you make a submission at akhaveyoursay.nz forward slash emergency dash budget. I also encourage you to keep sharing the link with your family, colleagues and friends. We've had an amazing response so far and we want to ensure that we've heard from as many of you as possible. On tonight's panel, we have Councillor Desley Simpson, Finance and Performance Committee Chair and Councillor for the Orake Ward. Councillor Cathy Casey, Albert Eden, Puketapapa Ward. Councillor Josephine Bartley, Maungakiki, Tamaki Ward, Tānofa Councillor. Councillor Pippa Coombe, Waitamata and Golf Ward. Councillor Tracy Mulholland, Fo Ward, West Auckland, represent. Welcome to you, Councillor Mulholland. Councillor and Deputy Mayor Bill Cashmore, Franklin Ward, a big talofa to you, Councillor, and welcome back. We are also joined by Andrew Duncan and David Gurney from our Finance Department. I'm Eddie Tuiavi'i and it is my pleasure to be your facilitator, aka mover along of conversation this evening. Our session this evening will essentially take about 90 minutes. It will be recorded and be made available on the website alongside questions and responses. While I encourage you this evening to express your views in order to ensure that you have all the information that is necessary to make an informed submission, please bear in mind that this evening's webinar isn't about reaching consensus with our participants around the screen. Before I hand over to our finance team, I've got two quick fire questions of Councillors Simpson and Cashmore. Councillor Simpson, I scrolled through my social media feed and I saw this comment and it was, households have to tighten their belts. They have to do without or they have to take on more debt. Auckland Council just passes everything on to the ratepayers. It's a total cop-out. Councillor Simpson, is this emergency budget a total cop-out? Absolutely not. And the last thing we are doing is passing it on to Auckland ratepayers. One of the things that Auckland Council took on board is to help with the $500 million hole is to actually make some savings itself. And it's committed to $120 million worth of savings in just one year. Now, just to give you an idea of how big that figure actually is, it is the size of our operating budget for libraries for two years. So it's hugely significant. Um, on top of that, we're also looking at a bit of a restructuring. Um, so the size of our organisation will change. There'll be staff cuts. And we absolutely are doing our bit to help with the problem because we realise that we are in a real emergency and we need to help too. Kia ora, thank you Councillor Simpson. Councillor Cashmore, a comment I read this morning while scrolling through my social media feed said Auckland Council should have been better prepared. You've wasted so much money in the past and now you want us to bail you out. May I have a comment from you Councillor Cashmore? Thanks Eddie and good evening ladies and gentlemen. And thank you for the comment that's, that you've given to me, Eddie, um, about council has, hasn't got its act together in the past. Um, I would refute that 100%. And I'd do it with this one simple statistic. Since 2010 till now, Auckland Council has grown in population by over 300,000 people. Yet in that same period of time, we have delivered a record OPEX budget last year of 2.3. We were planning on $2.6 billion this year. COVID means it has to come back to 2.3 or 2.2. But the, the really key point is our operational expenditure, our net operational expenditure, over that period of 300,000 population growth has increased by only an average of 1.2% a year. So we've done a heck of a lot more with an increased population with the needs and demands. But at that same time, we have also saved in excess of 270 million, not including what's going to have to be saved this year. And that's real hard cash, Eddie. So no, we haven't been sitting on our hands. We have been delivering record capex. We've been delivering cost-effective OPEX that's getting smarter and cost per head of population dropping. And we have been catering for a population growth that has been record high. So thank you, Eddie, for the question. 
Fafte, thank you so much, Councillor Cashmore. To our whānau that are tuning in this evening, um, for your information, it's a conversation and we start with a presentation from our subject matter experts from our finance department, um, buying you a bit of time to formulate your questions to help inform your submission. So at this time, I'd like to hand over to Andrew Duncan, the Manager of Financial Policy, for a presentation on the emergency budget. Andrew, I've got a bell in front of me and an egg timer. Your time starts now. <laughs> Thanks, Eddie. So earlier this year, we came to you with a business as usual budget. And things have changed substantially from then. COVID-19 set the world, New Zealand, Auckland, and the council. And the medium term economic impacts are unprecedented. We're facing a $550 million reduction in our revenue. So more than 50% of our revenue comes from non-rate sources fees and charges for things like building consents, fares for public transport, dividends from the airport, contributions from developers. All these sources have been hit hard. It means that next year, we'll be relying more on rates to get us through until things get back to normal. But we're striving to balance our operating expenditure with our revenue. Like every household or business, if we earn less, then we need to spend less. And these are some of the key themes that are coming up in the emergency budget that we're wanting you to feed back to us on. But in developing that budget, we've got to be financially prudent and look, look into the future to have a sustainable financial position. In doing that, we've got to recognise our responsibility to maintain the services and the foundations for modern urban living like transport, the water and wastewater system. But recognise the impact that's having on ratepayers who may be struggling and supporting the recovery of the city's economy and the businesses and ratepayers that make it up. So we've got a number of levers that we can adjust to help us manage our budget, manage our emergency budget. We've got rates, which I'll come back to, but the other four key levers are to cut the amount we spend on day-to-day -day activities, providing services, paying staff, maintaining our assets and funding community groups. We can cancel or defer some of our planned investment across the city in roads, pipes and community facilities. We can recycle assets so that's to sell or lease assets that are not being fully used or use, utilised by the community that aren't delivering the outcomes that we've aimed for for the investment we hold in them and use those proceeds to enable us to maintain our investment and the assets the city needs to manage as it grows and to deliver the services you're expecting and used to. And finally, we can look at the levels of our borrowing. Now, while central government's in a position to be able to make a major expansion in how much it borrows, we're not in such a fortunate position. Now, while the council's got a very sound financial position, we are limited in how much more we can borrow. And like any household, when we go to borrow, the banks will look at our ability to make those repayments. And we've got debt to revenue ratios, revenue to income ratios that we have to look at. We've invested very heavily in recent years to deal with decades of underinvestment and to invest in the sort of assets that are required to support a growing city and maintain the level of services that you have all expected and to be able to deliver those for our new residents. That means we're very close to the limits of what we can borrow. We want to maintain our AA credit rating because that ensures we are getting the best interest rates we can and that we maintain access to capital markets so that when we need to borrow, we're able to do that into the future. We are proposing to go slightly over our limits in the short term, and that will enable us to manage some of the immediate impacts. So we're going to look to go over our 270% debt 
for one year but not as far as we might go because we need to keep something in reserve in the event that there are further unexpected events over the horizon and in particular that could include a need to invest in more water supply and if, if a drought continues. So alongside these options we've got presenting you well, alongside these levers we're presenting you with two options to look at in terms of the level of rates increase a two and a half percent or a three and a half percent rates increase. Now both of these increases in rates are going to require some substantial savings to be made within the organization. We're going to have to pull back on our investments across the city and we're going to have to sell some of our underutilized assets. As far as the savings goes, Councillor Simpson referred to $120 million that we're looking to pull back on. But on top of that, 3.5%, we another $54 million of savings and an additional $21 million at 2.5%. And that will have impacts on the services that you see across the city. They'll be noticeable at 3.5%. And more materially so if we go to two and a half percent. There'll be some reductions in staff numbers. There are voluntary pay reductions for staff included in that. We're also looking at our capital budget and to put some numbers on those deferrals I referred to earlier. We're looking at a 2.3 billion dollar capital budget for the 3.5 percent increase. And this is still a substantial investment in the city but about 280 million less than we'd planned and these projects will still take place but further out into the future. That will come to, that capital investment program will come down further at a two and a half percent increase coming down another 60 odd million dollars and I've already referred to the savings levels. So those are impacts that you'll see in terms of the assets that we're investing in in the city to deliver services and in the actual service levels coming from our existing facilities. What it means for ratepayers, for the average residential, average value residential property in the city, three and a half percent, about $95 a year or $1.82 a week and $70 a year and $1.35 a week for the two and a half percent. So you've got a difference of about 47% between 47 cents between those two options alongside the impacts on the services that you'll see us delivering to you. Now there are also two other things we're asking you about in this consultation. One is a rates postponement scheme targeted at people who've been affected by COVID-19 by the economic impacts of it. So this scheme would be open to ratepayers who own their property at the 26th of March. They'll be able to defer 20,000 up to $20,000 of their 2021-22 rates. Now you'll know that we've had, our, some of you will, but we've also allowed people to defer their fourth quarter rates invoice which was due on the 28th of May till the 31st of August. And many people have taken advantage of this when they've been affected by the shutdown, particularly when we're at alert level four. We're also going to allow people who are still in financial difficulty because that deferral only provided a temporary respite. We recognize that many may still be struggling. So the new scheme that we're proposing would allow them to defer up to 20,000 of their rates for the next year and to bring forward $5,000 of any deferral they'd made from the fourth quarter. They'll then have a year to pay that back. So this scheme's focused on residential ratepayers and small to medium sized businesses. The third consultation question we have for you is our proposal to suspend the accommodation provider targeted rate for the first nine months of next year. We've already remitted the payments required in the fourth quarter. 
Because of the impact of COVID-19 and our move for the various alert levels, the closing of borders, it's been a big impact on the tourism industry. We've cut back our spending on major events and visitor attraction. The accommodation provider rate funds half of that through a rate applied to hotels, motels and Airbnb properties. Not spending the money, we don't need to charge the rate, but we believe this expenditure will be very important to revitalising the tourism sector as borders open up again and indeed to encourage some domestic tourism. So we are planning to spend some money next year, but it'll only be about a quarter of what we our intentions originally were. Given that and the likely timing of the benefits flowing through to the tourism sector and indeed the accommodation providers, we're not going to charge that on the rates bills for those who pay the accommodation provider targeted rate until the fourth quarter of next year. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. To our listeners and viewers this evening, I just want to uh, draw your attention. Uh, there are some of the questions that have come through tonight that I've noticed uh, are frequently asked questions. If you go to the website that I mentioned at the um, top of this webinar, and that's akhaveyoursay.nz forward slash emergency dash budget, uh, frequently asked questions are uh, posted there um, alongside previous uh, webinar recordings or the link to those as well. To kick off uh, Q&A, and thank you for the questions that have come through so far, Councillor Cashmore, you mentioned it in, 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 a, in a previous webinar, but I appreciate that some of our viewers, um, this is their first time tonight. An easy fix is potentially to defer the CRL construction for a year, pick it up when we can afford to do so, and we'll, all will have been set back as the opening and using it by 12 months. Is this not a correct assumption? Uh, sadly, Eddie, no, it's totally incorrect. Deferring any project that's already contracted and has started comes with contractual liabilities. So there would be money to be paid to the uh, Link Alliance team whether the work was been happening or not. So that's the first point. The second and probably the even more expensive point is, and having built, been in the, in the construction and building game, but I know a little about this, and that is to stop a project halfway through, the costs of adding to covering up exposed steel, protecting existing concrete, half-structured roof places, um, and also one of the worst ones is um, uncovered spaces for water egress. Add huge bills to any half-completed construction site if it can't be enclosed. So for the central rail link, it's important that the work carries on for the cost reasons, but more importantly, so it can be delivered by 24, 25, and the advantages that it gives us with public transport, doubling of the capacity of our rail network, shortening the times of transport on the rail trunks, and delivering a quality, timely service for Aucklanders. So um, delaying the rail link, um, sure, it might be an easy, attractive, simple option to put forward, but when you delve into detail, it's expensive, both in money, but also in lost opportunity. Thanks, Eddie. Thank you, Councillor Cashmore. Councillor Mulholland, you were a participant on our uh, inaugural or our first webinar that we hosted last week, Sunday. And a passing comment from a friend of mine over the weekend got me thinking about a reflection that you made during that initial webinar around genuinely wanting to hear from and genuinely taking the time to read all of these submissions that come through because essentially we want to hear from them. Councillor, any, any reflections or top of mind thoughts from you about the importance of making a submission because do, do we read them? Do they inform our deliberations? Oh, kia ora. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to be here again, um, team. It, it really is a pleasure to be here and to hear what people are to have to say. So it's nice that um, you have an associate, a colleague um, or a friend who does um, follow these and listen to the um, things that we're sharing. So to answer that question, I think it's a really valid question um, because in the weekend actually I did have a couple of people who 
um, I met with and they said oh they weren't sure about whether we do listen well I want to um, just share with you I spent two hours with those people and I also spent about an hour and a half with a gentleman who um, emailed me being unhappy with what he had seen in the press with regards to some of the wages um, so yes we do listen I would vouch for all the councillors that I see sitting here and I know that I work alongside that we do listen and we are influenced by those decisions and the reason it is critical that we read this information is that informs decisions and one of the things that I would say from the process that I see is that it means that we are speaking on behalf of those that elect and represent us for the betterment of Tamaki Makoto. So I am a firm believer and a firm supporter in undertaking um, that process of listening and taking note of what people say. I actually go online as well, um, Eddie now, so um, not, not that I'm short of information, of course, but I do like to go online and see what my community and other community are saying across um, Tamaki Makoto. One of the things I also did was I purchased my own advertising in our local um, beacon, um, a magazine to um, ask people to input and have their say and so far it's been really good to um, hear from people and actually I've been genuinely um, happy that we've had some really positive feedback about people understanding this situation and that's given their own um, scenarios and some of those people that I've talked to have actually lost jobs but they are still supportive of the good work that's done so I say keep the questions flowing we are reading we do concentrate on them and it does help influence our decisions so kia ora tato for that thank you so much mahala nui for that thank you Eddie. Ka wihi. thank you councillor Mulholland I now come back to our subject matter experts. You've signaled that there are some of these questions that have come up and they're great questions that you want to address. I wonder if you could start your contribution to this particular segment, Andrew, by speaking to, there's, there's one that's right at the top and it says, given that New Zealand has moved to level one earlier than projected, will revenue projections be recalculated and budget reductions adjusted accordingly before this budget is confirmed? That's potentially a, a Councillor Cashmore question as well, but I just wanted to bring that up front because I know that you, you and colleagues have worked extremely hard on this document, but it's a valid question, is it not? It certainly is, and very topical, as I was just meeting with some of my colleagues to, re to be reviewing our forecast economic projections. And they are possibly looking a little better, but we need to see how things will pan out. The councillors will get advice on this, and certainly there is the flexibility that if our revenue turns out during the year to be better, then the councillors will have the opportunity and the organisation to make appropriate adjustments if we're fortunate enough to be in that situation. But at the moment, both the projections and the budget and anything we might do leading up to the final decisions remain just that forecasts and we need to be conservative when we're responsible for managing so much of the vital infrastructure in the city. There's a couple of other things here I can uh, talk to briefly Eddie if you like. Please go ahead. There's a comment about whether the reductions in renewals and uh, in renewal investment in some of our facilities are temporary or permanent decisions. Most of the capital expenditure commentary in the budget documentation is about the timing of the expenditure, not whether it's going to proceed or not. So it's, lo it's looking at the time frame at which the investments would be made and putting those out, reflecting our... The other thing with that is uh, was a comment about the, the focus of our investment decision making and where we're going to put our capital investment. So one of the key things that the councils looked at is which kinds and of capital investment will make the most benefit to stimulating the economy and providing jobs and employment both in the investment activity itself but flowing through from that into the rest of the city's economy and that's been one of the factors in the 
decisions about the timing of projects. And a third question I've seen has been a question about the natural environment and water quality targeted rates. So some of that investment has been deferred, but all the money that's collected for those purposes will be spent over the 10 years on improvements in water quality and in the natural environment. The money is a targeted rate that can only be collected and spent over that time frame on those activities. So it's just a change of when it's going to be spent. The sum will be spent on those activities. Thank you, Andrew. I think this is a good segue into one of the questions that I see posed here. And this is, a, I guess, a, a quick fire rapid for the elected members that are in the room, whoever wants to make a comment on it. And the question asks, how do savings such as reductions in public transport concessions or closure of public toilets align with Council's universally ac accessible aspirations, especially age, disability and family friendly strategies? And I, I do appreciate that it's come up before and it'd be something that that you, you elected members will wrestle with because we've gone out, we've talked to our community, they've told us what their aspirations are, they told us what they want to see prioritised, they told us what is essential to them. How do we navigate? How do we deliberate in that space? Um, Councillor Cashmore, if I could start with you. Thanks, Eddie, and thank you for the question. It's This is really tricky stuff simply because it is about usage, funding, and availability. So we are seeing, we've seen a big drop off in public transport because of COVID. We're now seeing it pick back up. The services that we provide need to equate to the demand. However, we're also lost um, the delivery of some of our new trains that are coming from Spain because of COVID. So that's going to take a bit longer to flow through. So some service deliveries will have to be delayed and there will have to be some savings made in the PT area, especially in some of the specialist products on the weekends and so forth, just to come within the cost effectiveness of this current budget brought on us by COVID. So I wish it wasn't the case. I wish we could deliver frequent service every 10 minutes, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Sadly, that is not the reality. I'd also emphasize the fact that PT is not available to all Aucklanders. There are many people in the North, the West and the South who do not have advantage of A to B PT. It is more complicated than a simple service cut. It is about equity and delivery of services across all of Auckland as far as it's practical and is financially viable. I wish it was different, but that is a reality in which we currently live. Fafte, Councillor Cashmore. I've got a comment uh, from Councillor Coombe. Uh, kia ora, good evening. Um, thank you for joining us on the webinar. In terms of um, the questions and the queries about where we're looking to invest, I think it's really important to give that feedback. There's a question that asks question four. It says, what is important to you? And that's where we really need to hear what the priorities are and whether Aucklanders are willing to pay for that as well. So I absolutely agree that we should be prioritising our strategies to make um, Auckland an age-friendly city. We, um, across supporting public transport, improving road safety, and um, we just need to hear that feedback. So I just wanted to make a quick comment that there is an opportunity to complete that on the online form. That's really simple and it's question four that just asks, well, what are you, what's important to you? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Coombe. Got a, a reflection or a comment here that I might ask um, either Andrew or Councillor Simpson uh, to speak to. And it, it, it asks the question, why do so many savings initiatives impact most significantly on low income groups especially when the need for low cost access to community and recreational services is growing. And I guess the question, like, if I were to reframe it again, is, is this budget unfairly skewed against those in the low income group? Councillor Simpson or Andrew, if you've got a comment. Let's start with you, Andrew. Some of the savings are about looking at the opening hours for some of our facilities. However, our teams in doing that will be looking at the areas 
or the times when these are least used so that it has the least impact on the consumers of the services and it'll be looking at the facilities that are the ones that aren't heavily utilized and this will ensure that it has the least impact but it will still have some impact but it's having the least impact on users david do you have anything you, you could add to that yeah sure, sure andrew um from my perspective i think this is where local boards um have a role too so um Local boards have been involved with councillors in terms of local board chairs and in, in putting together this emergency budget, but they will also play an important role thinking about the impacts that a lot of these savings and a lot of the service level changes will have on the ground in local communities. Um, so to me, um, th that's where the real kind of impact on communities will be thought through, and I'm sure those local boards will be thinking about the community needs when making decisions about what it looks like on the ground. Look, I Thank just you. want to make it really clear um, that absolutely that is not the intention, Eddie, um, of this emergency budget at all. Uh, and I'll say it again, that is not the intention of this budget at all. So just to be um, absolutely clear of the process, look, staff have come up with a number of options that will help us make the numbers work. They're not necessarily options that the councillors and the mayor have um, suggested on our own. That's not the case. These are, these are independently assessed options. I think it's really, really important that you have your say on what is important to you and how you feel about that. Because if the feedback overwhelmingly is more for this particular area, well, absolutely, we will look at that. So I just want to make it really, really clear that that was not the driver behind this budget. In fact, quite the opposite. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Simpson. I want to cross back to uh, you, Andrew um, and David. And there's a question here that asks, what are the new opportunities for earning? Have you explored those? And I think it's it's quite an important question off the back of a lot of these comments that rightly state, well, you know, things have changed drastically to when we drew up this document. Have we explored any new opportunities uh, for, for, for economic growth or for earning? David and, and, and uh, Andrew, please. Most of the activities that the council is involved in and undertakes are public goods like our roads or services we want to encourage people to use, swimming pools, parks, etc. So there's not a great deal of opportunity nor a desire in these economic circumstances to be charging for these activities. However, every year the council is looking at the fees and charges it sets and ensuring that we're recovering the costs for services we provide directly to people. We're also working with central government on new ways of charging for development that are both more effective at raising finance to support development and taking the burden off council. Thank you, Andrew. There's a Question here, Councillor Cashmore then asks, why did council continue to sign contracts after declaring a climate emergency that were clearly going to increase transport carbon emissions, such as for new and wider roads? Did council's resiliency planning not highlight this as a risk? Uh, Councillor Cashmore, have you any comments on that? Thanks, Eddie, and thanks Heidi for the question. I think it's a very, very important one. So the Auckland economy functions on service industries and on mobility. And that mobility might be walking, it might be cycling, it might be someone in their car, it might be a train, it might be a bus. But it also, for the economy's sake, is heavy transport. And if you think of all the concrete that is in the CBD, that is in the suburbs, north, south, east and west, 88% of that concrete comes out of my ward, Franklin, in the south. That aggregate, is currently going to be between 12 and 15 million tonnes this year, depending on COVID. And it's transported by trucks. Can't be done by rail. It can't be done by bus. It's done by trucks. And some of those new roads, such as Mill Road in the south, that's what it's for. 
all of those four big quarries in the south connect to Mill Road within a, a, a maximum of 25 kilometres. So that is an alternative motorway strategy. The people who work in the south, 90,000 in the Penrose area, um, 45,000 around the airport, soon to double to nearly also 90,000, and new growth areas of Drury all require transport links for people on public transport, walking and cycling, but they also need to move goods and services. So did we think about um, climate change? Did we think about a resilience in the future? Most certainly, an economic resilience enables an ecological and environmental resilience. The two go hand in hand, they're not separate entities. You can't have an economy without an environment and you can't have an environment without an economy. We need to strike the balance that delivers both. Thank you, Councillor Cashmore. There's a question here, um, our SMEs will appreciate this, We've, I, I, and I don't believe that the answer is up online yet. Uh, David and Andrew, is there a comment um, around why is the America's Cup still on the books? I think we've got some contractual commitments to the America's Cup, which we made before COVID-19 hit. However, we have made some reductions in the spending we're committing into that area, and there's some detail on that in the supporting information. I think we've pulled back $10 million out of our committed spending to the America's Cup. However, we're still committed to our contractual obligations as a host city for the Cup. Thank you, Andrew. I see a comment here, and it's made me um, think about you, Josephine Bartley, and the work that you do in the community. Um, you know, you love your community, you're out there serving them, and I guess it's similar to the question that I asked Councillor Mulholland. How keen are you, how important is it for you personally to be hearing from your community by way of a submission? Um, thank you, Eddie, for the question. Uh, it's very important for all of us to hear from our communities, especially because there are, there are groups that always come to council, they always put up their agendas, um, and it's the squeaky wheels that you know, get hurt, but we have so many in our communities that don't normally engage in council processes, and their issues are just as valid, only they don't know council process, they don't know about submissions. Um, and so it, it is very important for more people to hear about this, for more people to see the social media, the newspaper ads and get involved. And especially in regards to the other question that was posed about, um, you know, why do so many savings initiatives impact most significantly low income groups? Um, yes, it's, you know, local boards will, will do a lot of thinking on the ground in terms of the impact on the libraries and rec centres and community centres. But in that regard, it is very important that we hear from our communities that use the libraries and the rec centres and community centres to say to us that this is their priority and this is what we should prioritise prioritize and keep going. Um, reduced hours or not, uh, because there will be other groups uh, really pushing their own agendas. So it'd be good for um, a lot of our community who don't normally engage to push this agenda. So thank you for the question. Thank you, Councillor Bartley. I notice uh, a lot of questions here um, are skewed in the direction of finance. Um, so because we've got our subject matter experts here, uh, a carte blanche opportunity until the, uh, the, the bell rings for both you, Andrew and David, to give uh, the question machine a really good whirl. I'll start out with looking at one of the questions that came through about whether we're seeking any support from the government. So we haven't included support from the government in our emergency budget, but the government has asked all of the councils across New Zealand for shovel-ready projects, projects that the government can invest in that would support the economic recovery. We've made an extensive list of proposals to the government, and if we're fortunate enough to have some of those accepted, that will ease some of the pressure on the deferrals we've got in our capital spending. And we're certainly hoping that we'll be successful with some of those key projects. David's got a question you want me to answer? 
Thanks, Andrew. Just before we uh, cross over to David, um, and I guess this gives you another opportunity, Andrew, to have a, a look for another great question that you'd like to answer. I've got a comment from Councillor Simpson before I come to you, David. Oh, look, I just want to say that, you know, from a council's perspective, we welcome any help that the government can give us. I think the most frustrating thing is, is that they told us they wanted to hear about the projects that we wanted them to invest in, and they have known our timeframes around putting the emergency together, and yet we still don't know when we're going to hear that. So I suppose if anyone from the government is listening, um, could you please get yourself together and help <laughs> come back with an answer as soon as possible because it could potentially make a huge difference to this emergency budget. We're having to go through the very, very painful process of, you know, cutting and dicing and trying to make things work. And yet, you know, some of the investment opportunities that are on the table are significant and we may not we may not be in quite as bad position if, if they uh, come to the party as we've got all our fingers and toes crossed that they will. So I think, yes, the frustration thing for me is around not having any idea when that will occur, when they know what our time frames are and how limited we are uh, to work within our own um, uh, criteria and, and, and things that we can do ourselves without their assistance. So that's been quite tough from my perspective. Thanks, Eddie. Thank you, Councillor Simpson. Back to you, David. Yeah, thank you, Eddie. Um, I just noticed there's a, a few questions about staffing at Auckland Council. <clears throat> and the questions are specifically about whether there's going to be a recruitment freeze or a sinking lid. Um, so as Councillor Simpson um, mentioned right at the start, we are going to come out of this budget um, as a smaller organisation um, and unfortunately there will be some cuts across the board. Already we have let 1,100 contractors um, go and that was in our initial response to COVID. Um, and of course, as we look across different sections, um, we will be reviewing roles and having a look at um, do, does every role provide the, the, the maximum value it can to the organisation? And there will be some reviews. Um, it really comes down to the rates increase scenario. So under 2.5% and, and under, for example, it could be up to, um, I think the estimates around 900 job losses. So it all, all depends on the impact um, um, of rates, the, the impact on the budget and, and what happens in terms of services we deliver in the city. Um, I also just want to mention that um, there have been voluntary pay cuts that have been signed on by staff so far, and, and this is staff who earn over 100,000 um, or more. Um, 800 or more than 800 staff have actually taken on voluntary pay cuts. And um, so far, at the end of last week, it's represented about $2.8 million worth of savings. So um, there is there is quite an impact on stuff and, and um, you know, that, that's, that's the that, that hard pill that we have to swallow. Before I come back to um, Andrew, I just want to segue there and Councillor Simpson has, has, has touched on it, as has Councillor Cashmore. I just want to get, I just want to crystallise it further. And the question to you, Councillor Cashmore, is, is council doing its part? I understand it's a frequently asked question and I understand we've addressed it, but the more I scroll through social media, the more I see that it's potentially not getting out there. Councillor Cashmore. Thanks, Eddie, and it's a really important and relevant question. Are we doing our part? I believe we are getting there. It's, it's very, very hard when you look at council's activities. You think of all the things that we do. You turn the tap on, that water that comes out, that's Auckland Council. You walk your dog in the park, that's Auckland Council. Take your grandkids to the playground, that's Auckland Council. 500,000 people go to the library each week, that's Auckland Council. You go to our regional parks and our beautiful coastlines, that's Auckland Councils. You flush the loo, it goes away, that's Auckland Council. Just keep thinking about it. All those things that Auckland Council touches you directly, what would you like cut? One of the people uh, conversing with us the other night said, make everything user pays. And I said, well, that's, you know, I have a great degree of sympathy in user pays, but where do you draw the line? Do you charge those people using the library every time they take a book out? Do you have to put $2 in the slot to go and to walk in the park with your dog? Do you have to pay a dollar to put your grandchild on the playground? And I suggest no. There are some things that council does and has to continue doing 
It is for the social good of the citizens of this city. And we all need to share in the cost of that through rates, through fees and charges, and quite frankly, through rents. People who pay rents are paying rates indirectly. It's important that we continue to provide services that the public want, that the public need, but also that council can afford. And in this time of COVID, we have to draw those strings a bit tighter around the want and need and say, you might have stretched it out of it, folks, for a year or two till we come out of this COVID. But one of the critical points we must have is when we come out of it, we have to have the ability to come out. If we strangle council's incomes, council's OPEX and CAPEX, we won't come out. We will push the economy and Auckland's economy further into recession. We will we'll increase unemployment, poverty, inequity and devastation. We need to do our bit to try and keep the finances of the city going, but be prudent and calculating around how we do that. With equity as the highlight lens which we see things through. We need to deliver what's needed. Focus on the essential things like public transport. Focus on the things that people love and enjoy, like our parks and libraries. But maybe those parks won't be mowed quite as often. Or maybe those library books might just be a little bit older before they are replaced. That won't be the end of the service. And it's something that we can rebuild back up on. But if we have a very, very low rates increase and a very, very low revenue base, those things will get shut and shut for good. And that is not a desirable outcome for anybody. The two options that are put forward are the ones that the politicians around the tables at local board and at council have deemed to be the most prudent and the most pragmatic for the city going forward. It's not a perfect world and it never will be, but we can here but do our best for the citizens of Auckland. Thanks, Eddie. Thank you very much, Councillor Cashmore. Back to you, Andrew. We've had a question about the emphasis of our investment. Our, our chief economist is saying that, as I repeated earlier, that investing in pipes and roads to enable housing growth is an important stimulus for the economy in Auckland and an important part of getting people working, keeping them working. So very a lot of flow through benefits from these sorts of investments. But the question is concerned that that's got too much emphasis on supporting greenfields. So the council's unitary plan provides for both a target for a compact city and it provides for growth within our current limits, but also in some of the greenfields areas. Our investments are to support growth in both areas and not university greenfields. There's a big emphasis on upgrading and installing new pipes and roads and public transport systems to facilitate intensification within the city's boundaries. And you can certainly see this happening in Mount Roskill, for example. Fafte, Andrew, I've got a comment from Councillor Bartley. Um, thank you, Eddie. It's just in regards to a question uh, regarding how much data do you have on the value add that libraries and community facilities bring to people in the city. I think that question is kind of fraught because um, how you measure uh, the value of our community's facilities isn't just through data and it isn't through surveys that we pick up. Um, it's through, um, you know, the use that people have of it and what it means to that community. If I can give you an example, uh, if we look at the Glen Innes Library, that's a community hub, but it doesn't get measured about being a community hub. It gets measured for being a library. Um, how many books are taken out, Wi-Fi usage, um, you know, people through the door. So that further um, emphasizes the need for people to put those stories through to us through this um, submission process so that we get a full picture of the value of our facilities and not just numbers. Thank you. Fafte, Councillor Bartley. Again, I prompt my uh, finance colleagues to have a look through the machine and pick a question. This question is to our elected members and just a comment from, from anybody really. And the question here, I think is a good one. It's a valid one. No doubt it's something that's top of mind for you when you're around the governing body table deliberating on these decisions. And the question is, the comment in question, many people feel 
they can give back towards improving systematic poverty and improve inclusive practice by voting on 3.5. However, many people have lost a lot of trust with council's ability to deliver and show delivery. Councillors, is, is there a comment, uh, potentially a, a commitment? Is there a response or a reflection? And I'm looking to Councillor Cashmore to kick off this court at all. Yes, thanks for the person who put that comment through, that question through. It's, it's quite a technical one and quite detailed, but the simple answer is we have delivered on a capital program at higher levels than ever before. So the public should have, be having confidence that the council's delivery of capital programs, whether it's new community facilities, a pool, whether it's a road or a footpath or a park or a playground or an upgrade to a library, these things have been delivered at this current year over 90% of the budgeted capital amount. In years gone by, like 10 years ago when we started, it was out in the 60s. So huge improvements have been made in that delivery. The challenge has been the ongoing population increase has put pressure on the number of people using those services. So we've seen some roading um, levels of quality service fall away. We have seen PT being, being really highly patronized um, and we haven't had the new trains or the buses being delivered quick enough to a company that the required extra growth. So there's real challenges, levers here that we can't control completely ourselves. One thing COVID will deliver us is a lot slower population growth. Last year was probably 40,000, the year before that 45, the year before that 50. This year it's talked about being five. Now we don't know whether that's going to be the reality or not, but if we had a couple of years of 5,000 population growth instead of 40, we would have a good chance of starting to catch up, not only in the level of delivery of social services and transport services, but also the delivery of housing, which is mostly funded by the Crown for social people, social housing requirements. So there's a real challenge around this stuff. Um, we will continue to monitor our capital program really strongly with longer term procurement, which gives you cheaper options uh, per unit, per square metre of pavement, um, per playground, per hectare of mown grass, simply because a long term procurement project is bankable for the companies who are tendering for those projects and those contracts. Thanks, Eddie. Thank you, Councillor Cashmore. I'm looking around the room to the elected members if there's another comment uh, on this uh, this question before moving on. I know that uh, you guys have all sent me messages. There's questions you want to respond to. Is there another response before I move on? Councillor Simpson. Look, I think um, th th because we've got an emergency budget and are in an emergency time, I think there will be a lot more uh, of a magnifying glass over exactly what we do deliver and how we deliver it and how um, how good we are at our spend. So I suppose the, the real key is to make sure that your priority projects are there, but you clearly see in the 2.5 and the 3.5 the cuts or, you know, the things that we potentially can't you know, the, the, the less the rates income, sort of the less we're able to do. I suppose that just takes me back, Eddie, to the point that, you know, for a long time we've been very proud of the fact that we've um, only taken 40% of what we need to do from the ratepayer and, and actually 60% has come from somebody else. But actually when that 60% dries up and you're only left with a 40%, well then, you know, there's a there's a very limited amount of money you have to spend. And then of the 40%, you've got some people, you know, especially the most vulnerable who've been particularly hit as a result of COVID-19 uh, that will not be able to pay their rates. And so as Andrew Duncan has said, you know, our rates remission policy is then very clearly uh, tied to helping those you know most vulnerable. So you take away the 40% and you take away some of that 40% that won't pay and you get a smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller number to actually deliver what you have. So when this budget is finally landed and in some form it will be, and I look around the room at my colleagues to say, you know, help because we need to, you know, we actually need to get this to a point that we will. And I'm sure they will. Um, I think the delivery of um, of those of the works associated with that will be absolutely key. Uh, Councillor Cashmore's right. Delivering uh, capital projects will assist 
not just Auckland, but New Zealand in our economic recovery. So it's important that we keep that right up there and do as much as we can with the little that we do have. But look, I, you know, the concern I have, Eddie, is really some of that concern around the things that keep getting eroded away. So I, um, I sort of urge Aucklanders really just to, to focus on the things that are really important to us and let us know because, you know, I'm sure I speak for, you know, most of my colleagues, no one wants to cut anything more than they have to. You know, we don't. We know that there a lot of what we do is incredibly valued by Aucklanders. And so we want to try as much as possible, to, you know, to help our most vulnerable and to, and to keep Auckland Council's essential and core services, you know, operating with as least impact as we can. Um, and so we're asking you to help. And we're asking us all to work together to get us to a place that we can help Auckland get out of this crisis and recover and be better and brighter than it's ever been before. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Simpson. For the benefit of our viewers and listeners this evening, but also potentially for me, I mean, I do understand it's a lot to take on. There's a lot of information here. Andrew, are you able to break down that 60%, that half a billion dollars again for me, please? And then I've got a comment from Councillor Bartley before I move on to Councillor Casey uh, around the panel's question. Andrew, could you could you break it down for me again, please? Well, some of the highlights, that's not the right word, some of the lowlights. So border restrictions and restrictions on gatherings that we've had recently, the carrying on border restrictions <coughs> and people perhaps being hesitant to gather together in groups despite being alert level one. 40 million less from rev uh, revenue from conventions, concerts, visits to Auckland Zoo, for example. Could be 30 million from some of our community facilities, pools, holiday parks, leisure centres. 40 million less in public transport fares. 40 million less from parking and enforcement. 20 million less from our regional fuel tax. Won't be getting 60 million from the airport dividend. In Ports of Auckland dividend revenue down another 60 million as well. Economic uncertainty means developers won't be building as many houses. 60, 50 million on that one. Reduced water usage because of the drought. 75 million. So this quite a few big numbers on our in our revenue space. Now that, that leads into a couple of other questions I'll sneak in before Eddie hands over to one of the councillors. Someone's asked why we can't have higher rates increases. The council's gone with two, with a balance between the rates increases and the spending that require, required for us to be prudently managed in the future. If you think there should be a higher rates increase, it's certainly the sort of commentary that would help the councillors balance their decision making. I think a 5% rates increase would take you $1.85 for um, 3.5% uh, up to $2.50 a week. There's also been a question about whether we should have a rate on empty houses. There's a few technical issues associated with that. It has been considered, but it's quite difficult to do in the New Zealand environment because our laws are different than those that operate in countries overseas. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. See, because you threw a bit of a curveball and went on, I want to throw a curveball back before I give it to Councillor Bartley. My apologies, I will come to you. And probably because I've forgotten the answer. How, how Andrew, do we receive 40 million less from parking enforcement? Do we not enforce it? How, how does that come about? I know there was a response um, recently, and I think Councillor Cashmore, but while we're with the SMEs, can you, can you address that, please? And then I will come to you, Councillor Bartley. I'll pass that to David. Yeah, so that assumption, I think, is driven off the fact that there are lots more people working from home. Um, so you won't get the traffic coming in and parking in the inner city. So that, that then um, on the amount of enforcement revenue that we get. Thank you, David. Councillor Bartley. Um, thank you, Eddie. It was just in relation to the question about mistrust of council to deliver. I was just trying to understand that question, but 
uh, if I could offer some comments. In terms of delivery, it's pretty hard um, to argue that delivery isn't happening because we get so many complaints from people about congestion due to construction, cones, and so you can see the money is being spent or was being spent um, because now we're kind of financially struggling and projects will be put on hold. But you can see the delivery is there. I guess in terms of mistrust, fair enough because you know we're local politicians, it's council. But um, you know, one way to counter that mistrust is through transparency and openness. And I do honestly believe this budget is a good step in that direction because it is all in there. It's in the supporting information. And you know, it's kind of a little bit embarrassing to put out how bad the situation is, but it's being honest and it's being open and it's being it's put out there for everybody to see that we're not hiding anything. And this is really um, a, 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 an opportunity to try and get through this all together because everybody will see this is how it is and this is why it's important for people to submit because they, you know, it would be good if we could all take ownership and, and get ourselves um, out of this together. Thank you. Fafdai, Councillor Bartley. There's a question here around the demographic advisory panels. And it is a significant mechanism, platform, that Te Kaunihiro Tamaki Makoto Auckland Council has in ensuring that community voice is delivered authentically and genuinely to Auckland Council. I also suspect or propose or would posit that it's along the spectrum of greater civic participation. We've got the submissions process, which we're currently having this quarter about. We've got voter turnout every third year. The question here is, will the demographic advisory panels still be funded? It is incredibly important to ensure the voices of these communities, for example, disability, Māori, and that's Matawaka, that's Mana Whenua, Pacifica, ethnic, Rambo, all our communities are still consulted with. Councillor Casey, have you a comment on that, please? Pressing budget, as you've heard from everybody. You know, normally when we when we do our annual budgets, there's always some great things, some new things we're doing, some excitement around it. This time, you know, we need to hear from you because it's a it's a sad, sad budget. Have we made the right decisions? We've tried our hardest. We have spent hours on it. But the question about the demographic advisory panels lets me say something really special that yes, 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 the six demographic advisory panels have embedded themselves at council. They are so important that all we've done is we just had to delay the process. So the, the six panels will be up and running. They would have been up and running by May. That might be extended out now till July and August because we've had to do the applications online and all that kind of thing. But I just have to categor categorically say that the voices of our communities, such as the rainbow communities, people with disabilities, the seniors, youth, ethnic people, Pacifica, these are really important. And as long as they are not represented at the governing body table, we need to hear directly from those communities. And the work that has been done in the past has been absolutely critical to the governing body. So they give us advice that shape our decisions and that is ongoing. So that's not part of any cut to this budget and I'm delighted to be able to say that. Thank you for the question, Edie. <laughs> Thank you very much, Councillor Casey. I have a comment from Councillor Coombe and then um, I also uh, have a, uh, a comment from Councillor Cashmore. Thank you, Edie. I was just wanting to respond to there's quite a number of questions about how this budget is a climate resilient budget. Um, and the questions are ranging from, you know, why aren't we investing in cycleways? What are we doing in terms of climate action initiatives? And um, I would really like to see this budget as a, not just responding to the huge revenue loss, but also the climate emergency. 
And um, where we're at is that the Climate Action Plan is going to be finalised in July, and that will provide us with the foundation of actions that we need to look to get funded going into the 10-year budget next year. Um, there are still initiatives within this emergency budget, and I absolutely want to would like to come out of this with um, more investment that we can find to invest in initiatives that will mean that we can have a much more uh, low, low carbon future. But we need that feedback. We need to hear the feedback about what people want us to prior prioritise. So um, that th there has been a whole range of questions on our climate initiatives, and I just want to acknowledge those and um, just give that, that brief comment. Thank you, Councillor Coombe. I know that uh, Andrew is going to get ready now because he's identified a question. Councillor Cashmore. Thanks, Eddie. Eddie, and I'd like to answer the question around the operational expenditures for economic development of $213 million for both 3.5 and 2.5 rates increase. So this is a very important factor. It actually is helping make Auckland the place that it is. So sure, we're not getting the uh, overseas tourists that we had coming into the city, but Auckland is the destination for Kiwis, not just overseas people. So when we have things like um, all wonderful events, the concerts, Pacifica, Polyfest, Diwali, the Lantern Festival, the art, the writers, the photography festivals, we're supporting community arts groups, are all helping create more local economy, and tourism from around New Zealand. Auckland's an exciting place to come to, and we're seeing you know, the hotel rates are at such a people are coming from outside of Auckland into the city to experience the big smoke, to go to the restaurants, to walk the promenades, to enjoy the shopping, to see the sights of Waiheke, Great Barrier, to go up north to the beautiful beaches or down to the east coast on my side on the beautiful beaches, to go out west to the black sand surf beaches, both the north and the south. So the economic development package is about that. It's also about creating and fostering new entrepreneurialism in the city to create employment and economic endeavor. So should we cut that? I think not. That's like taking the wheels off your car or the tracks off the train tracks. It would derail and de-incentivize economic growth a good fortune and quite frankly make the place a boring old place like it was when I was a kid. I like a vibrant, fun Auckland and there's nothing like a, a Sunday afternoon at Diwali. It's a real buzz. Thank you, Councillor Cashmore. Just give our SMEs an opportunity. Is there anything from either of you, Andrew and David, before I move on? I'd just add to that that it also reflects the investment in Auckland tourism events and economic development, the investment they make in supporting the city's businesses and they've been quite active in working with many of our businesses in the last few months to try and support them and advise them and so there's also some value for the city and the economy from that invest from that spending particularly at this time. Thank you, Andrew. There's a, a comment here, and uh, thank you, David, for sending that response through. I understand you have agonised over this. Can we see the principles you have made your decisions by? I can't see, see those in the documentation. Um, the principles are on page six of the consultation document. But what this question has prompted in me is an opportunity to go around the table and, I suppose, ask the councillors, have we agonised over this? Because we've said up front, it can't be responded to in a business as usual manner. Looks great on paper. For those that mightn't have time to tune into all the meetings where you've wrestled, you've deliberated, you've had endless, endless and countless dialogue over this. Have we agonised over this? And Councillor Mulholland, I might start with you. Oh, thank you, Eddie, and thank you to the member of the public for posing this very, very good question, because it probably comes to the point that Councillor Bartley made earlier about trust and 
what I would like to share with you as a new councillor, which is absolutely fabulous and I'm grateful for this opportunity to work with this outstanding team um, of elected members and um, staff. Now, I would say that for me, I absolutely um, spent many hours working on this over and above the meetings we had. I have been in dialogue with other councillors. I have been in dialogue with staff to ask questions about this budget and I'm sure um, the um, subject matter expert Andrew Dunkard could definitely confirm my questions around some of these issues that have been raised. It is done sincerely and also I've posted up um, information on social media and asked for say as we went through for the information we were allowed and able to release given the scenario. So I would say um, the principles that guide me are Whilst I have property, this is a representation of the people that I um, work for, and that is the community. And that is all community, whether you pay rates or as mentioned by our Deputy Mayor, whether you are renting or whether you rent a room, you all have a say in this. So um, the principles I have are that, one, that I owe it to the people of the community, whether they vote for us or don't, that we do the right thing by uh, Tamaki Makoto as a whole as we progress into the future. Um, and also the principles of how I've been raised, and that is that you do the right thing. So I, I won't take up a lot more time, Eddie, because there's a lot of things I could say about you know, the principles of how and what, and I'm very open to any public feedback with regards to that, and I stand by all the councillors that um, I work alongside and that we are all sincere and dedicated to the cause of making this a fabulous city, and this has been very, very challenging, especially, I believe, for a, for a new councillor. Um, I thought I'd be able to um, put my hand up for a number of things in the budget, but unfortunately, given the scenario we're in now, when we're not able to do that but um, hopefully moving into the future we can do that so the principles are real based on trust faith and working for you the community kia ora thank you kapai councillor councillor bartley have you agonized over this budget um i've agonized to the point where i can't and i can't remember your question <laughs> what was your question again? like the it's it's agonising to try and answer that question that you get so lost in it you forget what the question is. So yeah, the agonising over the budget, how we pr our principles over the budget. Oh, okay. Um, I think at the end of the day, it's uh, it comes down to what is best for Auckland. Um, looking at our budgets, looking at the things that we need to do uh, to get our communities through this uh, in a way that um, you know doesn't affect our future uh, in a bad way. So um, yeah, it's it's very 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 difficult but also bearing in mind um, those that are most vulnerable. Um, and then also questioning ourselves, why am I sitting in this position? Why did people vote me to get in here? So um, yeah, never losing track of that. And um, yeah, just doing, just, just looking at a budget that um, will reflect uh, the need to um, address some of the inequities out there, but also get Auckland through this uh, COVID period. Thank you. Fuff day, Councillor Bartley. Just for the benefit of our viewers and listeners, um, I notice that we're coming up to the hour, so we're gonna wrap up uh, shortly or soon. But I just want to remind you, um, as mentioned throughout our webinar this evening, if you've asked a question and a response hasn't been given, we see them, we will respond to them. Keep checking our website. Councillor Casey. We've done a lot of that, but I have never been more proud to be a New Zealander. We smashed the curve, we beat the virus. Now we're into recovery and I've never been more proud to be an elected member on Auckland Council because we have done this together. Your councillors, the mayor and 20 councillors have spent hours trying to sort a recovery for the people of Auckland. 
And we might not get it right. Already people are saying to me, we don't want you to shut an animal, an animal shelter. Well, that's fine. Make your submissions. Please read carefully what we've done. What guided me? People, people are hurting. They've lost their jobs. They've lost income. They've worried about losing their homes. So we need to make sure we need, I felt that we needed to make sure that we were supporting the people who've been worst affected by COVID-19. That's at the heart of this budget. And that's really, really important. Um, have we got it right? I'm not sure. Please read it. Please add to the 15,000 submissions we've got already and tell us we are listening. So this, this proposal was made by all of us together. Now it's over to you, Aucklanders, to tell us if we got it right. And if we haven't, guess what? We'll change it. Thank you, Councillor Casey. I'm looking here at a question, and it's a great question. Potentially, it's a chicken or the egg kind of a question. And I'm looking around the room at our elected members, and the question is this. How do you balance this emergency budget being a response to the half a billion dollar non-rates revenue loss and the need to future-proof Tamaki Makoto because we are striving to be the world's most livable city, a world-class city that attracts people. How do we balance that? Can this budget balance that? Is this the opportunity for that? Is there an opportunity for that? Responding to the non-rates revenue loss and the need to future-proof. Councillor Cashmore. That's the half billion dollar question, isn't it? And it's 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 a really good one. So and as Councillor Casey was saying, and as, as Tracy has said, and, and, and Josephine Pippa, this is all about balance. And it's not easy. So we have, we've looked at that revenue loss. So, you know, $525 million we are projecting to be lost out of non-rates revenue. So that's, as Andrew Duncan said, development contributions, water charges, um, stuff to do with transport and public transport lost income to council. It's a big number to make up and we probably can't make it up unless we put rates up in the 20s of percent and we're not going to do that. So we have to cut our cloth to meet. The point is, I think the most important point is this is not forever. This may be for a year, two at the most, hopefully not even that long. We don't know how long COVID is going to last for. We don't know how long how deep it's going to be and how much the pain is. But we have taken what we consider to be the most likely scenario and we have accounted for that. Desley Simpson has done a magnificent job in ensuring the finance and performance budget looking through all those options. And we have gone through screeds and screeds of figures looking at the unintended consequences. You cut this contract, how does it affect a contract alongside it? Can we squeeze the lawn mowing and town centre contracts just to get a little bit more out of them to save a few million dollars? We looked at the nice to haves last year and they've gone. We're now looking at the essential things and saying, what can we do to make them <clears throat> deliver as much of them as possible, but we probably can't do it all. We're looking at our staff and that's hard. You know, we've spent a long time developing capable staff <clears throat> who give up a lot to the city. You know, I know well, some members of the ELT have come in from private sector jobs and have taken 50, 60, 70% pay cuts. People who used to be the boss of ACOM Engineering Company, um, people who were, who, who were the Chief Financial Operating Officer for the Commercial Bank of Australia, people who have had high paying and highly remunerated jobs in all parts of the private sector have come back to council to work because they wanted to give back to their community. And to say to those people, um, we don't need you anymore, that's almost a crime because when we do need them in two or three years time, they probably won't be there. We need to keep as many people as we can that is practical and reasonable as we can. We need to balance that budget with the pragmatism of retaining capability so we can deliver in the future. And that is that balancing that lever. Auckland Council does not borrow money to spend on day-to-day -day operating expenses. We only borrow money 
to pay for capital improvements and developments. And that's a critical factor. So is this simple? Is this easy? No, it's not. Um, has it been a lot of fun to do? No, it hasn't been. But it has to be done. And like Kathy, I'm very proud of the way the councillors have knuckled in and you know doubled their back against this COVID wheelbarrow, pushed hard to say, we can find a way out of this because we must and we will. And together, we'll emerge stronger and better because of it. Thanks, Eddie. Kamoto Wehinga Mihi Kaikonu Hira Kashmo. Really appreciate um, your Fukado, your contribution uh, to that reflection. Councillor Coom. Thank you. I think this question really highlights that this a big part of this conversation is around do we want to end up with a budget that's an austerity budget or do we want to have a budget that's focused on investment in the community and in, in jobs and in growing Auckland. And I don't mean just growing in terms of physically growing, but becoming a, a stronger, better Auckland. And um, so there has been some fantastic questions that have come through and I'm glad that we're going to be able to answer those afterwards so then none of them are going to be missed. But I just wanted to make a bit of a concluding comment about why it's so important to read the material um, and and look at what the choices are. I mean, I think that we've gone into this budget and councillors have unanimously said that we have to approach this in a sustainable way. We, we have to try and balance the budget as much as possible and look at all the levers open to us. We've had to make some very difficult decisions, but it's been cuts right across the board. So this is where we really need to get the feedback about what are the priorities, what's important to Aucklanders, and where should we do our investment. And hopefully on the way through, we're also going to have an opportunity to re-look at the council's income and hopefully it won't be such a dire situation by the time we get to sign off on the budget in July. But um, this this really is the, the conversation that we need to have with Aucklanders and have a very robust conversation about what's important to you, what are the priorities that we need to focus on right now. And I think the COVID crisis has really shown that there's far more to council than just roads, rubbish and regulations that we actually support the community in in Auckland and support jobs and in many, many, many ways. And we support the vulnerable and provide a whole lot of services and facilities that are important to, to Auckland. So thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to take part. Um, that's enough from me. Kira. Thank you, Councillor Coombe. I have a comment to uh, here's an opportunity for Councillor Simpson. Oh, thanks, Eddie. Look, you know, um, I must admit there has been more than one moment in the last uh, three months where I haven't uh, wondered why I accepted the role of chair of the Finance Committee, let me tell you. <laughs> it's probably going to be the toughest budget uh, that um, certainly Auckland Council's ever done in its absolute history. Uh, it won't, I won't rest happy if it's just a slash and burn budget. You know, I won't rest well if that's just a slash and burn budget. I know that's got to happen and I know we have to cut our coat to suit our very tiny cloth, um, but our cloth, cloth, sorry, cut our cloth to suit our coat or coat or whatever it is. Um, uh, we, we've got to save money and, and we are doing that. We absolutely are doing that. But also, look, you know, we're, we're doing a, a big value for money exercise and I noticed that I'm here with Councillor Mulholland. She's the Deputy Chair of that committee as well. And we've committed to, uh, to find half a billion uh, dollars worth of efficiency over the three-year term, just deliver it, le delivering better value for money. But the most important thing is to balance the budget in, in cost saving and keep us moving forward. If we just stand still, we'll actually put Auckland one step behind. You know, COVID-19 has taken a, a big hole out of a lot of things, you know, and, and you know, I'm with a number of councillors, very proud of where we've come to as a, as a city and a nation as to dealing with the health crisis. Crisis, but we've got an economic crisis that we've got to deal with as well. So this budget for me has sort of three key, three points really. It is to, to, to make savings and to make cuts to try and fill that big um, half a billion dollar hole. To actually 
keep moving us forward as far as delivering an infrastructure and building um, building building assets for the city to help take us forward. And the third most important thing is to make sure we deliver for you, the people of Auckland, uh, because we are all in this together and together we will get out of this uh, to, uh, stronger, I believe, if we all band together. So I, look, I just want to thank people who've taken the time tonight to put their uh, questions forward and to participate in this. It's going to be really tough. And we thank you for your input. We thank you for your feedback in advance. And we know that together we will make Auckland stronger. Thank you. Kapai, kia ora, Councillor Simpson. I want to come back to your corridor a few moments ago, Councillor Cashmore. Informative, emboldening, straight to the essence. It was a straight up response. But there's a, there's a part of me, and it, it's come up in the questions, and I see it time and time again. And I invite your comments, and I also want you to address the, the, the comment there that Councillor uh, Simpson made about the slash and burn, because you had a fabulous response last night. But the question is, uh, Councillor Cashmore, and no doubt you would have seen it, you would have heard it from the community. Be that as it may, our emergency budget response, when it's all said and done, can't we just borrow more? Councillor Cashmore. Thanks, Eddie. I think a day doesn't go by when I don't get an email or a text or a phone call from someone saying exactly that. Just borrow more bills. It's that simple. Interest rates are cheap. Well, interest rates are cheap. And, you know, cheap as I've ever seen them, Eddie. Um, however, when you buy a house or an asset, it has a value, and you can borrow money against the value of that asset. Council's assets are things like roads, bridges, Pipes, footpaths, parks, playgrounds, libraries, community facilities. Very, very hard to sell those if time gets tough. So our borrowing capability is based upon our revenue, not our assets. And that is a strategic difference between how councils operate and how private sector operate. We are not borrowing against our assets, we are borrowing against our revenue. That's why this downturn in revenue of 525 million hurts us so badly. And that's why because of that, we have to drop our capital program back from an expectation, as I said earlier, 2.6 billion to 2.3 or 2.2. It also means we have to have cuts in operating expenditure just to try and take up some of the slack as well. So just borrowing is not an option because simply if we borrow in excess of 270%, the banks from whom we take those bond issuances would say to us, hey, you're breaking those. So even at 3.5 and 2.5, we will go from our maximum borrowing ratio debt to revenue of 270%, we'll go to 290%, but it'll just be for one year. And then we'll come back. And the banks have told us, Standard & Poor's have told us, as long as you have a managed program to get back within your prudent borrowing limits of 270%, within 18 months, we will be okay. So we are focusing on doing that. Not to do that would have two major effects. One, our interest rates would go up. And if interest rates went up 300 points, that will cost us $550 million over 10 years. $550 million. But also, and what's even more scary, is that our ability to borrow money would be a lot harder. And it'd be a lot, the money would be a lot more scarce. So the capital program will be severely impinged, not only with high interest rates, but a scarcity of funds, and the term that those funds are issued will also be shorter. Instead of being five or seven years, it could go down to two or three. So there's a treble whammy there by breaking your prudent levels of debt handling um, for any length of time. So I think that's an absolutely critical point. And that's where Desley and the team have done a superb job of saying, yes, we'll break those limits for a bit, because not to would absolutely destroy the capital program and be a massive catch-up build over the next 10 years. So we break them for a little bit, but we come back in, still underneath the prudent levels, and we have capacity and capability to carry on the rebuild. And that's a critical thing. You know, um, Eddie, you know that I've a, one of the things I do, I've got a sheep and cattle farm in the south of Auckland up the Hunua Ranges there. And I'm literally within you know, half a day's walk of the dams. So I can see how low they are. We've just been through the biggest drought in our record. And one of the things we've had to do, or my son's had to do, is sell 25% of our breeding ewes and 50 potentially 
50%, certainly sold 40 now, potentially 50% of our breeding beef cows. That's not because we want the cash, that's because we've got to survive the winter. So just like council's cutting its cloth, us as business people are cutting our cloth in a massive drought situation in rural New Zealand so that we can come back stronger in the years to come. It's having a multi-year view, not a single year view. And um, it's good sound business practice, hard as it is at the time, but some things just have to be done the hard way to come out the other end. Thank you to all the people tonight. It's been a great response, the highest number of people on this webinar I've had tonight. And a great set of questions. Uh, it wasn't actually the questions I was expecting. And for those who haven't had answers, um, the staff will be generated to give answers to you, or I'm sure any of the councils here will take an email from you and we will answer them individually or collectively, because we want to be able to participate in this process to ensure that you are really well informed so that you can get the great answers back to what's required for this whole consultation process, which is really successful, best we've ever had. Thank you, and thank you to our staff and team. Cheers, Eddie. Thank you, Councillor Cashmore. Aroha mai, Councillor Cashmore, to our team and also to our viewers. I feel it would be remiss of me to ask this question because I think it's it's a good opportunity, and this is coming back to you, Councillor Cashmore. And I guess I wasn't thinking about it, it wasn't in my thinking, but when you mentioned the interest rates are, have been uh, are the lowest for as long as you can remember, it triggered something that I've seen the first week we went live, right? And it implies and respectfully that there are different generations that our decision making will impact. And something that I saw on social media, and I just think that I don't want to lose the moment, is you've done your dash, you've paid your dues, why not just come up with a budget where you guys cruise and pass it on to future generations? And I know it's a, it's a massive question, but I've seen it, Councillor, and I know your responses because I've seen them, but I just think it would be remiss of me off the back of that um, to not ask it this evening, and then I promise we will wrap up. Councillor Cashmore, if you will. Uh, my dad fought in World War II, and his uncles in World War I, and I'm wearing this tie today because some of them lost their life this week in World War I, and this is the poppies of Flanders. And uh, they came back from those wars, and they started to rebuild a nation. My great-grandfather rode into our valley on a horse. His son, my grandfather, came out of that valley when he was dead, 60 years later, on a tar-sealed road. Um, you imagine the changes that man saw in his lifetime, from horseback to a person landing on the moon. Think of the changes that I've seen. You know, I'm 63 years old next month, and um, when I went to school, it was pen and pencils and paper. Whiteboards didn't exist. It was the end of my secondary school, and computers landed on, I think, those great big things, you know, the size of about three beer crates. You know, they were huge um, and were slow as teeth. Um, we've seen this country change so much, and the pace of change has increased, and everyone's participated in that. Council borrows money. The government borrows money. It's not to service one generation. It's to service things intergenerationally, and that's why you have a debt ratio. That's why you borrow the money so you can deliver the better roads, the better facilities, the better parks. You can buy that bit of land for a great coastal park for the future. And that's what it's about. It's not about us. It's about our makapuna. It's about our future. You know, nothing I enjoy more than um, working in the veggie garden with the grandkids on a Sunday afternoon, watching them laugh and chuckle as they're picking beans or, or capskins, and, and they get so excited by it. Or seeing their schoolwork. Because that is the future. It's not us. You know, um, we've got a lifetime's experience of learning, uh, making mistakes. And God knows I've made plenty of them. But you learn from them. You don't give up. And you have another crack. COVID is a learning experience for this whole of this country. And by, by gosh, we've done a great job on the health side. Now we have to do a great job on the economy side. We have to be sensible. We have to be pragmatic. I use these words a lot. But that is the rule. And we have to be intergenerational in our thinking and purposeful in our deliberations. And that is our aim. Cheers, Eddie. Thank you, Councillor Cashmore. When you mentioned the mokopuna, I think of the proverbial Māori expression, Heaha te mea nui o te ao. What is the world's single most important thing? He tangata, he tangata, he tangata. It is people, 
It is people. It is people. To our viewers and our listeners this evening, again I say, have your say on Auckland's emergency budget 2020-2021, because together we can recover stronger. I also think about the Māori proverbial expression, mapango mafero kaoti te mahi, with black, with red, the work is completed. You've heard from our elected members this evening. They can't do it without you. They've agonised over it. They need to do it with you. Go on the website, find their email, hit them up. Find their phone number, have a conversation with them. We want to hear from you. Submissions close on the 19th of June. Please make a submission. Thank you so much to the team that have enabled this webinar this evening. Thank you to our elected members. Thank you, most of all, to our community. Po marie matewa. Sure.